First of all, a very warm uh, welcome to everyone who decided to join us uh, tonight. Um, my name is Theophanes Exadactylos. I'm a professor of European politics at the University of Surrey, and I'm the outgoing co-editor of the JCMS Annual Review. Now, uh, it's a great pleasure to be uh, here at Sciences Po. It's been a few years since I was in this room uh, on occasion of the conference of the ECPR on the Standing Group on European Union some years ago. Uh, and presented work, uh, but today I'm very lucky because I'm presenting the annual lecture and I will say a few words about it in a moment. But before that, I would like to thank Eleonora Russo and Sebastian, of course, for their the very good organization of this event, so thank you very much for hosting us. Um, I will say just a few words about the annual review. Um, it is the uh, supplementary issue of the Journal of Common Market Studies. And its aim has always been to um, make a review of all the key events and current affairs of the European Union and its surroundings in the previous year. So effectively, when we are talking about the annual review of 2023, we are talking about all events that happened in 2022. Uh, the role of the review uh, is to bring together scholars that are very well established, but also some junior colleagues who are at the start of their career and they can offer us their new and novel insights into some of the most burning issues of Europe. Um, and this year, we have a fantastic lineup. The um, whole review is out uh, today, coincidentally. So uh, all of these um, articles are available online for you to use, to read, <coughs> and to make reference of. But most importantly, I'm very, very excited about the fact that uh, this year's annual lecture will be provided by Professor Tanya Bertzel, um, who has been uh, an inspiration uh, to me personally, when I was a PhD student, uh, she's one of the most established figures in European studies and European politics. Um, I have used a lot of her work around Europeanization, so thank you very much for providing a framework for my PhD. Um, and uh, of course, she's very well known about her contribution to transnational governance um, in her uh, role at the Free University of Berlin. Today, however, she will be reflecting on her piece that uh, is out on the annual review uh, concerning the multiple crises of Europe and reflecting on the crisis of Ukraine <laughs> and what kind of impact it has on European integration and, of course, decision making and its progress. So I will not do any more spoilers uh, for that matter, and I will let uh, uh, Professor Bertzel uh, speak uh, for a few minutes. Then it will be followed by a discussion with Christian Lequen and Jan Rovny, and then a moderated discussion um, uh, for everybody to discuss uh, and ask questions at the end. So without further ado, thank you very much, Professor Bersel, for doing this for us. A big, warm applause. Thank you, Fanis, for this really nice introduction, and I'm so excited to be here. I mean, when Fanis um, asked me where I would want to give my lecture, and I said, hmm, Paris, of course, right? I mean, Berlin is not bad, but I mean, I live in Berlin, so, um, and um, I'm, I'm very grateful, particularly to Eleonora, Sebastian, Florence, and um, all the other countries, Christian and Jan, and everybody who made this possible. But it was a little bit short notice, and I know, I know that a lot of things are going on currently. It, oh, things are always going on at Sciences Po, right? But it's a very busy time, I realize. And so I'm extremely pleased to be here today. Um, the first time I was at Sciences Po was for the ECPR, I think it was the Standing Group on International Relations in 1995. I had just started my PhD at the European University Institute where I met quite a number of people who are here in the room. If I had known, I mean, this is great. I mean, not only it's a fantastic group of students, I assume, but also quite a number of, uh, of colleagues and longtime friends. So it's, it's really fantastic uh, to be here. And I should also say, um, not only have I personal connections with Sciences Po, um, there is a long-standing collaboration and partnership between Sciences Po and the Otto Suhr Institute at Freie Universität Berlin, where I'm based, um, because of uh, we are we were the first the first two institutions that established a Franco-German study program, 
We have now we have three master programs and one BA program, and I I'm, I have the suspicion at least some of you actually are part of these programs. Um, and so we're going to celebrate our 40th anniversary, 4-0, four 4-0 zero, huh? four zero, uh, anniversary next year. So um, it's not quite decided yet whether it's going <laughs> to happen here or in Berlin, but of course I hope it's going to be in Paris because that would give me the opportunity to come back. And finally, um, Sciences Po is also a strategic partner of the cluster of excellence I'm directing. It's called Contestations of the Liberal Script. It's a little, it's not a very intuitive title. What it is about essentially is why is it that liberal ideas and institutions are increasingly contested, right? Criticized, rejected um, these days. And I'm re the reason why I'm mentioning is, is that Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine, right, is a quintessential example of very extreme contestations of the liberal script. I'll come back to that point. So here we go. When uh, Fan has invited me uh, to, uh, I mean, you write an article, right? And then you give a lecture based on the article. So to write the article first, I said, gee, I really don't have the time. But it's always tempting because it gives you the opportunity to think a little bit outside the box, right? You, I mean, you, the whole idea is to look back, to reflect on past events and take a little bit bigger picture. and. Given my previous work and the war that was going on, I mean, I could not not talk about the, the, the Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. Okay, so um, and a lot of it had already written about, been written about this war, so I was wondering what kind of angle I could take. And then I thought, hmm, I did some work previously on the various crises of the European Union. I mean, the European Union has been in crisis ever since I started studying the European Union. Seriously, I mean, for 20 years, at least. Um, so in a way, it has become almost normal for the European Union to be in some sort of crisis. But some people have argued that this crisis is special. It is an, it's not your usual crisis, yet not yet another crisis. It's a special crisis. And so again, a lot has been written about that too, that now finally the European Union is approaching its moment in which it's going to be make it or break it, right? So, I mean, they, they're about Belgian state building and whatnot. There's a huge debate going on, right? And I thought, well, but what is this crisis really about? In fact, is it really a crisis? I mean, it is a crisis, but is it the crisis of the European Union? Well, I mean, I have only 8,500 words, so at some point I decided just to take it as a crisis of the European Union and look at it in comparative perspective. Is this a new crisis? Is this crisis different from previous crises? If so, in what way? And um, I've drawn, in doing so, I drew on, on some work I've done with Thomas Risse um, uh, in a special issue edited, I believe, we did several special issues, one in the Journal of European Public Policies and the other in the Journal of Common Market Studies, uh, in which we tried to come up with an identity-based explanation for the various crises, not their emergence, but their outcomes. If you look at, and we sort of we compared the Euro crisis and the Schengen crisis and said, well, in the Euro crisis, we actually saw a deepening of European integration. In the Schengen crisis, we did. So how do we explain this? That was the starting point, right? In the meantime, we had yet another crisis, the COVID-19 crisis, and then the Ukraine crisis. So I thought, okay, I'll take these four different crises, look at their outcomes, and then first decide to what extent the Ukraine is different or not, right? <coughs> and it turns out the Ukraine crisis indeed is different. Um, previously, we have sort of had crises that in resulted in a deepening of European integration in terms of institutional reforms, giving the EU more competencies and or, you know, a shifting uh, towards majority voting, pooling or delegation, as we call it. So you had centralization and more pooling and delegation, a deepening of European integration. The COVID-19 is, is, is another example, Euro crisis, COVID-19 crisis, both resulted in some deepening of European integration. The Schengen crisis, in contrast, nothing, right? I mean, some people say, it's stagnation, others even say it's disintegration. And I mean, we can add the Brexit uh, crisis, um, but I'm focusing on this one. Now the Ukraine crisis is interesting because it, it presents yet a different outcome. 
On the one hand, we don't have institutional reforms, no further centralization of competence. It's not the United States of Europe we see emerging here. We don't even see an institutional reform of the common foreign security and defense policy, right? We don't see that. But at the same time, on the other hand, we see the member states being remarkably united in responding to Putin's war of aggression against Ukraine. I mean, I'm, just think about it. The EU unanimously approved, the member states unanimously approved, not less than, not fewer than 11 sanctioning packages. 11, right? Military aid, humanitarian aid, economic aid, right? Um, we, we welcomed several million refugees from Ukraine, which used to be a big issue previously, right? And finally, and that was the most surprising thing, after almost 20 years of enlargement fatigue, the member states offered Ukraine and Moldova and potentially Georgia a membership perspective. And in fact, the commission just recommended to open accession negotiations with Ukraine and Moldova. Hello? If you told me that would have happened a year ago, I would tell you would be completely out of your mind. So what I'm saying is we see the European Union remarkably united without, however, this resulting in some centralization of competencies or some pooling or delegation in the decision making. Now, isn't that an interesting outcome? Why is that? How do you explain that, right? And so one of the challenges for me in European integration studies is not only to explain a single event, right? I mean, we can always come up with some explanation for any of the crisis outcome. But the question is, how do you account for variation? Right? So it, the challenge is not only to explain why the member states have been so united, what I call upgrading of the common interest in the Ukraine crisis, but why they haven't been so united in case of the Schengen crisis. Right? So we have instances in which they have upgraded their common interest and engaged in, in institutional reforms. We have in, instances in which they did, didn't do either or. And we have now with the Ukrainian instance with, where they, they went halfway. They upgraded the common interest, but they did not engage in institutional reforms. Now, how do you explain this, right? So, and what I then do in the, um, in the paper is essentially I go through the various explanations offered by the literature. We can sort of, I divide them up in two camps, the functionalists and the post-functionalists. I don't have time to go into, read the article. Um, the bottom line is you need to combine these two approaches. Rather than arguing the interdependence people all get it wrong and the identity people all get it right or the other way around, I say, in fact, you need to look at both. So outcomes, crisis outcomes can be quite well explained by, on the one hand, the degree of interdependence um, and on the other hand, the identity discourse. So, Interdependence creates a demand for European integration. This is sort of the credo of the big schools of European integration theory, liberal intergovernmentalism, neo-functionalism, right? And then there was the post-functionalist response, which says, well, functional demand doesn't automatically result in more integration because there is politicization. And then the question is, why have the member states been able to depoliticize certain issues in the Schengen, uh, in the, and, and why they didn't in the Schengen crisis, right? And here, here comes a sort of Thomas Riss and my argument in, it says, identity politics. Depending on what kind of identity politics we have, member state governments are able to depoliticize certain issues, which then allows them to meet the functional demand of more integration. Of course, there has to be a functional demand in the first place, right? But only because there is functional demand doesn't mean that you get more integration when these issues become politicized. In the Schengen crisis, we had a huge functional demand for a common solution, and we still didn't get it because things were so politicized, right? But why didn't, why didn't, didn't, didn't things become politicized in the Euro and ultimately in the, in, the, in the COVID-19 crisis and also not in the Ukraine crisis? And the answer is the identity discourse was different from the identity discourse in the Schengen crisis. The identity discourse with Euro, the Euro, the COVID, and the Ukraine crisis was, it was about what kind of community is the European Union? What values do we share? So is it, it's about defending and, and sort of enacting our values. Whereas in the Schengen crisis, it was about what, who belongs to us, right? And 
these kind of questions are much harder to depoliticize. So in fact, what we're arguing is in mobilizing shared values and the war in Ukraine is about defending European values. Mind you, it's a social construction, right? But that's the framing on all sides. It's the framing by the Europeans. It's the, certainly the framing by, by the Ukrainians. And it's also the framing by Putin. Putin essentially also makes this about European values, which he rejects, right? So everybody agrees it's about values, and that makes it easier. So I want to conclude with the most recent crisis. The big elephant in the room, I hope. You know, what about the Middle East? Because this is also a military conflict, right? Like the war in Ukraine. And the member states are all over the place. They are not united at all. In fact, it's terrible, right? I mean, the European Union would have so much leverage if the member states could come up with a common position and they're completely unable. I've never seen the EU, in fact, so disunited than uh, currently in this conflict. So it's exactly the opposite of Ukraine. So why is that? Is it identity discourse? Okay, let me briefly, and then I, I shut up. Um, I would argue it is not the interdependence, is the perceived interdependence is low. <laughs> Europeans think this conflict is far away, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's different when you have a war right in your backyard or whether it is, which I think is stupid, honestly, because if the Middle East explodes, right, this will have severe consequences for the European Union, but that is not the current debate, right? So there is, in terms of functional demand for a joint position of the Europeans, pfft, no. Identity discourse, there is identity discourse, but not a European one. And that is interesting. The identity discourse here in France is very different from the identity discourse we have in Germany. And I'm happy to discuss this. But my last sentence is, we could, have a, we could make this um, an issue of European identity. We could do it. It's not done. There is an identity discourse. It's the post-colonial identity discourse that dominates, correct me if I'm wrong, very much in France. And there is this, this solidarity with Israel, anti-Semitism discourse, which understandably, given our history, is very dominant in Germany. And that is why I actually um, also suggested to Fannis that we do this here, because there's something wrong with the German-Franco or Franco-German partnership. It's not working. And if the two countries cannot agree, Europe, the European Union has no power, right? And I think in this particular instance, this is so obvious, and it has to do with the different identity discourses in the two countries, and I stop here. Uh, thank you. Um, Thank you very much, Tania. Um, I'm Florence Fauché. I'm the director of the Center for European uh, and Comparative Studies. Well, for comparative studies and comparative politics. I'm sorry, I'm a bit tired. Um, <laughs> so I'm mix mixing things up. So um, this is a great opportunity for us. And when uh, Teofanis uh, wrote to us, we, we jumped literally on the opportunity. And I want to thank the CERI um, who uh, jumped on the opportunity with us and also the EAP to organize this, uh, this great event. Um, I also want to take the opportunity to thank again the team from the CEO who has organized this at a time when you're all extremely busy and there are lots of events. So I thank you very much for choosing to come to our event and to listen to Tanya. Uh, we have two, uh, two discussions today, <coughs> uh, one from the CERI and one from the CEO. So we'll start uh, with uh, Christian Lequen from the CERI who has taught at Sciences Po since 1988, so presumably your relationship with uh, Tania uh, also go a, a long way. And Christian, as you may know, is, uh, uh, is an expert on diplomacy and in particular on the external relations of, uh, of the EU. And um, he has um, um, explored and indeed <coughs> uh, made his mark in uh, uh, his analysis of ministries of foreign affairs. Um, and um, he will be followed by Jan, um, uh, Jan Rovny, who joined uh, Sciences Po and the CEO in 2013. Um, and uh, Jan's research uh, focuses on democratic competition in Europe and in the EU. And he's particularly interested in lines of conflict in different countries and how these tensions um, 
um, contribute to, um, uh, to, uh, to form around cultural issues and ethnic identities. So I think uh, Jan is likely to have quite a few things to say about identities. Um, <coughs> Um, I will give them um, about seven to ten minutes so that uh, Tanya can then respond and we will have plenty of time for discussion. What I want to do is invite you two to come uh, to, he the, to the rostrum so that people can actually see you as well with when you speak. Well, thank you very much, uh, Florence, and uh, thank you to the organizer for inviting me to discuss uh, Tanya's presentation uh, together with Jan. Uh, Tanya, you're maintaining the co academic tradition of uh, discussing uh, European uh, integration from a macro perspective, and uh, this is, uh, of course, uh, something uh, very uh, 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 important, uh, also questioning the, the relevance of EU theoretical uh, uh, models, so I'll be happy to, to contribute with, uh, with my comments to uh, some of uh, the remarks uh, you have done in your presentation, but also in the, in the article. I'm a good student. I, I read the article in the uh, Journal of Common Market uh, uh, Studies. So I have probably tones of comments uh, I'd like to uh, address, but uh, I'm going to limit myself just to, 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 to five. Uh, first of all, what uh, strikes me in reading your, your, your article uh, uh, and uh, listening to you in the presentation, Tanya, is that uh, uh, you lead us to think about the limits of institutionalism when uh, it comes to the study of European integration. As you, you rightly uh, point out, uh, there was in the uh, theoretical literature an obsession uh, since the neo-functionalism uh, to consider that, uh, well, there was an upgrade of common interest uh, when uh, there was a delegation of power from the member states to, uh, well, new institution uh, uh, called uh, most often the, the supranational institutions. And uh, it explains why so many research in, uh, in European integration uh, have studied uh, European integration in, uh, in considering this uh, continuum, you know, going from intergovernmentalism to uh, supranationalism and, and, and focus only on the question of institutionalization or non-institutionalization of the delegation. But what you, what you show in, uh, in this uh, in this paper is that uh, you can have an upgrade of common interest without institutionalization. And I, I find it extremely uh, interesting, the, the example of the, of the common foreign and security policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Ukraine is, is the best uh, evidence. Uh, the, the 27 have, uh, uh, well, uh, upgraded the common interest while uh, uh, barely raising the question of uh, institutionalization. And uh, for us, uh, uh, researcher, it's, uh, it's an invitation uh, to, uh, well, probably uh, rethink uh, uh, the uh, importance we uh, devoted to, to institution in the, uh, well, explanation of European uh, in integration. Uh, we need probably more to consider the question of the common interest as a Bible in itself. And uh, this is my, uh, my, first, uh, my first reaction to uh, your, uh, your article. Second uh, reaction, if we, if we go back to uh, institutions, uh, uh, you show that the distinction, which is the traditional distinction between supranational and intergovernmental uh, isn't so relevant. Uh, our, our colleagues, uh, uh, Bickerton, Hudson, and Putter already showed that uh, in uh, their uh, uh, new inter or so-called new intergovernmentalist uh, model ten, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, if they remain very much focused on, uh, on, on institution, especially in the post-Maastricht uh, uh, period, they showed that uh, most of the institutions today uh, are a mix between intergovernmentalism and supranationalism. They call it de novo. 
uh, in institutions. And again, again, this hybridization proved that uh, the linear institutional continuum from, uh, from intergovernmentalism to pure supranationalism doesn't help us to understand the, uh, the upgrade of common interest. My first comment, Tanya, concerned the very case of, uh, of the Ukraine crisis. Uh, again, I, uh, I very much agree that uh, uh, in this case, the common interest uh, uh, resulted from a formal consensus among uh, uh, member states supported by elites, not only liberal elites, also non-liberal elites. Uh, just think about uh, the uh, involvement of the, of the Polish uh, uh, representative of the former government, the peace government. Uh, uh, um, this is what I have in mind. Um, I very much agree that in the case of Ukraine, the, the issue at stake is not just the, the, the question of borders, but it's the, the preservation of order. <coughs> this is something I really like in your, in your, in your paper. But in international relation, if we take the IR perspective, uh, when we're thinking about order, immediately we have to introduce also the notion of, of security. And in this case, it's a question of military security. So I wonder whether we scholars uh, shouldn't be thinking more uh, along the lines of maybe the specificity of military s security to explain the very specific reaction to the uh, Ukrainian uh, 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 crisis. And um, uh, if crisis uh, goes together with threat, uh, probably uh, having uh, a very special kind of threat, which is the military threat, uh, well, has a, has a special implication on, uh, on the way the, the, the nation states uh, uh, do react because it's the first time since 1950 that the EU member states are really confronted to a serious military threat. So uh, not surprising that uh, they upgrade a common interest without any need of new institutionalization and you see what it means. All the uh, debates we have about shall we move to qualified majority voting etc is maybe not so important. Fourth uh, remark, uh, this is about what you said on uh, the causal explanation of, of crisis, uh, which has to do mainly for you uh, with, uh, with identity uh, politics. I have to confess that personally, I always found hard to handle identity as, as, a, as a concept. I always had a lot of problems to, uh, to use it in my, in my own research. Uh, so this is why I'm, I'm, I'm probably, uh, or I would like to ask the question, um, is it so much identity which is important or, or increased politicization, which is not exactly the, the, the same? And um, in this respect, uh, I'd like to make two additional points. Um, I don't think that politicization uh, is something which has been discovered after Maastricht. This is a bit what the post-functionalist people uh, try to, to sell us, so the famous article, Hugi and, uh, and, and, and Marx. Um, well, we are in a country where in 1952, uh, and between 1952 and 1954, you had a lot of politicization around the question of EDC, the European Defense Community. And it was the same in uh, 1966 when we had the uh, uh, empty chair crisis. You remember the, the famous article by Hoffman uh, in the Adelos, The Fate of the Nation State in Western Europe. It was uh, written in, uh, in 1966 in the context of this, uh, of this very crisis. So I've never been convinced by the argument that we have gone from depoliticization, and sometimes you speak about depoliticization, and uh, politicization from permissive consensus to conflictual dissensus, right? Uh, I'm prepared to agree, however, that politicization have increased a lot since Maastricht. And now I, 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 I come to, to identity, of course, politicization refers to identity, but not exclusively. 
Yeah. I don't think the, the, the classic question, capital labor cleavage, uh, has, uh, has totally disappeared. It's, it remains also a viable to explain uh, politicization. If re you reject European integration, it's not just because uh, you uh, are communitarian uh, when the others, the supporters, are cosmopolitans, right? Uh, it refers also and still to your, uh, to your uh, social professional status. So this is why I uh, would like to introduce maybe an, a nuance in uh, the causal explanation based only on identity politic. And finally, finally, um, uh, I would like to come back to the, to the relations between crisis and, and European integration. What is interesting in your paper is that basically, for you, crisis end up with an uh, upgrade of the common interest. <laughs> so you are here very much in the tradition of the uh, neo-functionalist, what they said seven years ago, 70 years ago, right? Uh, you, you, we need to have crisis because from crisis uh, comes compromise and upgrade of uh, uh, an institutionalization. This is what uh, people like us, uh, like Lindbergh, Scheingold, etc., said. Or for you, statu quo. And when you, when you mention statu quo, you, you take the example of, of Schengen. But you don't consider the downgrade of the common interest. You don't consider the regression of what the body of literature today call disintegration. And there is uh, a, a, a huge uh, literature, Volmar and, uh, and, uh, and others about uh, disintegration. So I would like to ask you why you didn't go more in this direction of investigating uh, disintegration, why you didn't, uh, uh, well, uh, choose also to uh, mention Brexit because you, you, you didn't take a lot of time in your, in your paper to uh, uh, also uh, look at this, uh, at this uh, crisis, because in this case, it has shown that the common interest can, can regress. And it's clearly, clearly not a statu quo, it's a, it's a regression. So uh, this, this is why I think uh, we uh, have to, to continue working on, the, on this question of uh, effects of e causes, but also effects of, uh, of EU crisis. And I just would like to mention an excellent doctor, I'll see this uh, from one of your compatriots, Lukas Schramm, I don't know if you've seen it, uh, which was uh, uh, recently defended in, in, in Florence, and uh, I understand that it will be published uh, soon by uh, Bloomsbury. So I'll stop here, Tanya. Again, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to think uh, about the state of uh, European integration more from a macro perspective and uh, its, uh, its possible future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. And uh, I invite uh, Jan to, uh, to follow. Well, thank you very much, Tanya. Thank you very much to the CEE for the organization and the invitation. It's a great pleasure to have a chance to read this paper and have a chance to respond to it. I, I really enjoyed it. It's a, it's a neat, relatively short and dense piece. And I take, in line with Chris, uh, Christian, I take four important concepts out of it. And I think it's incredibly useful for this, right? The fact that European integration can be conceptualized along two distinct dimensions interest upgrading and institution creating. I think that's very important. And secondly, and this is perhaps slightly understated here by Tanya, but for me perhaps even more important is the idea that we need to con consider whether an issue brings a question of order. Who are we? How do we, how do we wish to organize ourselves? How do we organize our reciprocity? Or does it bring up the question of border? Who are we not? who is on the outside and who is on the inside. I think that's fundamental, and this directly speaks to the question of identity, which I think is central to the piece. So does identity mobilize us to think of, of who we are, or does it mobilize us to think of who is outside, therefore who we are not? Uh, let me comment on this, and my comments uh, will be a bit different. I'm a comparativist, so I'm going to approach this from the study of within state politics. And I will you know, immediately respond to some of the comments made both by Tanya and by Christian that 
I, I would like to open this member state as a black ball because, Tanya, you've mentioned there's been fantastic agreement among member states on the Ukraine issue. And as a comparativist, I kind of stretch, scratch my head and I say, okay, Orban voted for this. Yeah. But does that really mean that there is a lot of support? In line, I mean, th the question of politicization, politicization within states, right? I wonder, I have no idea, but during the empty chair crisis or the, e the European defense discussion, did French voters consider these issues? Because Slovak voters are considering Ukraine. Ukraine was a major issue in the very recent Slovak election, and the fact that a, an anti-Ukrainian populist was elected is a concern that suggests that politicization is present and that the member states are not so united. So what we effectively have is a country-level effect of general support. However, and here comes the comparativist who actually has data, because together with my colleagues from the Chapel Hill survey, we've collected party positions on Ukraine. Um, we've just submitted a paper. Unfortunately, it's not published yet, and the data are not public, but they will be soon, so please hold your breath. So, I mean, I, I get to come here and say, oh, I have data on this. Yes, I have data on this. The, the interesting thing that we find is, yes, relatively high level of support at the country level, but it varies. What does it vary by? It varies by the mobilization of threat. And this is where identity comes in. The countries that perceive, and I stress, perceived to be most threatened are most likely to be concerned and opposed. Baltic states and Poland, doesn't matter what their, what their governments are like, they are very concerned because they could be next. And because, most importantly, because they have been before. So what we find, the most powerful effect in explaining the country level variation on support of Ukraine is whether a country has been occupied by the Soviet Union in World War II. In World War II, I stress, not after. Right? Hungary, that's somehow forgotten what happened in 56. Very interesting. So have you been occupied by the Soviet Union in World War II? That will influence whether you support and how much you support. But that's country level, right? The Russian invasion of Ukraine produces a security dilemma that is nonetheless moderated at the substate level, and it's moderated by prior ideological constellations. What matters is three things, populism, so to what extent do you see legitimacy of traditional elites? If you do not see that, you are more likely to oppose all kinds of support to Ukraine, military, uh, refugee <laughs> acceptance, financial, and so on. If you are opposed to transnational EU governance, that's long for, are, do you like the EU or not? Do you, are you a Eurosceptic or not? If you like the EU, you are much more likely to support Ukraine um, and if you don't like it, you're much less likely to, su to support Ukraine. And both of these are moderated by governing status. So there is a strong bump if you are in government. If you're a populist in government, you're going to support much more than if you're out of government. Same thing with Euroscepticism, right? Uh, so this really leads me to three points about this. The unity on Ukraine is at government level only. There is very interesting and potentially worrying variation below. And this raises the question of where does politicization matter? Does, politicizi does politicization matter at the level of member state and the council decision making? Or does it matter at the party level and potentially at the street level? And the Slovak case would suggest that it might quickly connect up. Right? Because the moment it starts mattering at the street level and in elections, it's going to bring uh, likes of Fico and, and other populists who will campaign on the opposition to Ukraine uh, in, uh, and, and politicization will spill over this way. Um, support for Ukraine is based on the perceived threat that Russia poses to the EU, that is to us, right? Currently, the, what you call the Ukraine crisis is the Russian crisis. It is not the Ukraine crisis. And Ukrainians as refugees are perceived very differently. I mean, there's a lot of discussion about Eastern Europeans being very worried about a single Muslim f putting their foot onto Slovak or Czech or Polish soil. The moment Ukrainians come, the story is completely different. Well, identity explains this. Ukrainians are white, Ukrainians are Christian, and Ukrainians are Slavic. They learn Slovak, Czech, and Polish very easily, very quickly. Most of them know half of it anyway right, because the, they are related. Um, so uh, what will happen 
and that's the big question for, for the future that you kind of raise in the paper. What will happen to the question of order, that is how committed we are to protect each other, when the question turns into one of border, that is, are we going to let the Ukrainians into the European Union? And since Croatia got in, no one seems to be getting in. Talk to North Macedonians, right? They will tell you about how that border question and European identity interact with each other. So I suspect that the moment we're actually discussing having them in and paying structural funds and uh, free movement and all of that, uh, that, will, that will be very different. Uh, and it will suddenly be a question of border very quickly. So the role of identity is interesting because it is, it's interest generating, but it's also boundary making. When Russia is the threat, um, then we have integration, we have upgrading of common interest. But when we start talking about accession of Ukraine, and when that will in itself become a threat, and we will suddenly probably start thinking about this more in terms of identity border making. So I think the key question that we're facing here is not so much when interest is upgraded, but when identity is upgraded. At what point will we start thinking of ourselves not as Czechs or French, uh, but rather as Europeans and start and, and potentially include Ukrainians into that into that equation. Now, this you know Haas has considered this identity upgraded was supposed to be a part of spillover, but spillover was so automatic, and I suspect, and I mean, with the help of of your thought, is that interest is probably separate from identity, and that spillover, as many have already shown before, is not automatic. So, um, on this. Cautionary note, thank you very much, and I look forward to further discussion. Tanya, do you want to stay here to respond, or do you want to go back to the podium so that people can see you? Yes, yeah. I'm happy to go back. Wow, that, is, that was amazing. That is amazing. Um, and it also gives me the opportunity to elaborate on a few issues which I couldn't because yeah. in the interest of time. Um, so let me, let me briefly go through it. Um, the, the, the question of security and security threat, you both mentioned, right? I mean, Christian, you made the point, isn't it sim simply the security threat that makes the member state governments upgrade the common interest? And you said uh, the security threat galvanizes sort of public support, right? Um, so sort of upgrading, fosters upgrading of the common interest at the at the domestic level. And I would agree. The question is, is this about, I would, but I would put it in the functionalist corner. I would say a security threat creates, if you wish, a functional demand for more integration, right? In order to solve the security dilemma, and mind you, um, Christian, you're absolutely right with uh, that my, you know, the limits of institutionalism, the response from an international relations perspective, at least to a security dilemma, is institutions. You create institutions, right? Uh, NATO being a case in point. And you could argue that the crisis of the, it is a European crisis too. It is because Russia's invasion of Ukraine shattered the European security architecture and shattered any hope or illusion for a kind of cooperative relationship with Russia in the foreseeable future. I'm not even sure about peaceful coexistence, right? And this is why our chancellor for once was right when he said, this is a Zeitenwende, because we have to completely rethink our relationship with Russia. And that creates a functional demand, you could argue, right? And I think the French discourse partly speaks to that when Macron asked for more European strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, right? Mm -hmm. We have to become more self-reliant. We have to pool our military resources in order to face the Russian threat. That's a functional demand. My point is that this functional demand is not is asymmetric, as Jan said. The, you know, the threat is mostly perceived by those countries bordering, or just being cl the closer you are right, to Russia, the more threatened you feel. And then this, and that sort of, it's overdetermined, right? Because the countries that were close to Russia were you know, attacked and run over by the Soviet Union in the Second World War. So um, I think it's hard to disentangle the two, right? Um, 
Interestingly enough, what about Germany? What Germany was was attacked by? by we were number. Um, well, we were also occupied by the Soviet Union. So I wonder how Germany features in there. But my point is, security is more about the function on the functional side, right? Okay, that is that is is the first point. The second point is that the functional demand was not too strong, and I would argue, therefore, that identity discourse, which would have facilitated institutional reform if there had been a demand, but the demand wasn't too strong. And given that we're talking security policy here, this is the least likely case for more integration, right? You need a very strong demand for integration. So you had the discourse, the identity discourse, which would have facilitated that, but the functional demand wasn't large enough, particularly not for France, right, and or and for some of the other countries. Germany, I'm not so sure. Well, we haven't anything to pull to begin with. We're currently building up an army that might potentially be able to fight somewhere in 20 years from now, maybe. So it's really, um, this is really not about it. For Germany, this is cheap in a way, right? I'll come back to that point. So second point, identity and politicization. I'm talking about identity discourses rather than collective identities. Of course, identity discourses only work if there are collective identities, right? But I want to stress, it is about mobilizing certain identity constructions. And as Jan, you're absolutely right, the Ukraine issue could have been also mob you know, mobilized as an issue of borders. I mean, we could have had a discussion to what extent Ukraine is, yes, they're white and they're Christians, but are they Europeans, right? And, and Putin would say, absolutely not. They are Russians, right? They are Slavs or whatever they are, but they're not Europeans. And however you want to define European in terms of values or in terms of culture, in terms of whatever, right? So this could have also become, and it, I agree, it might eventually become an, a, a question once it is about accepting Ukrainians, Ukraine as a member state, but it, I, I should say, in, in, in Germany, the, the discourse is shifting. Germany has been welcoming, I mean, Germany has accepted the highest number, again, the highest numbers of refugees. We don't have an army to speak of, but we are sort of prepared to welcome refugees. And yes, you could say we've been more welcoming in the long run with regard to Ukrainians than with regard to Syrians. However, the mood is changing because we are totally overwhelmed with these refugees, right? At the local level, our mayors are, and so the populist right-wing party, the AfD, is starting to mobilize. And the reason, and that is my point, the AfD hasn't been too successful at the ballot box it is gaining in, in, in opinion polls, but in the elections so far, right, it could be so much worse. And the reason for that is the identity discourse, right? We defending, the Ukraine is defending our values here. And that's a very powerful discourse, not only with regard to the refugees mm -hmm. and coping with the costs they impose, but also with regard to the energy crisis. Hello, we have huge inflation. And unlike other countries in Europe, the German economy is not doing particularly well. We are, n we are much, we are, I'm not even sure whether we're recovering, but because we've been so goddamn energy reliant on Russia. So <laughs> no surprise, right? Still, given the costs of the sanctions against Russia and the little they seem to matter, it is surprising how supportive the German public still is, right? It could be so, so, so much worse. And it is not because of the identity discourse. That is the argument. Have I really tested that argument? No. But that is the nice thing about you know, this kind of article. You can develop an argument, and it should be logically consistent. Whether it holds water empirically, then is for others to find out. So I welcome any kind of attempt to you know, attack empirically the argument, also, of course, theoretically. But I never claim that I really have, you know, I have rigid empirical evidence for the argument. I'm just trying to build the argument. Okay. Um, very quickly, I think I have covered a lot already. Um, oh, and uh, the, the borders turning into a border issue. Watch this. Um, the proof of the pudding is not so much the accession of Ukraine. This is going to take years. Let's not kid ourselves, right? I mean, opening accession negotiations 
I can understand where it comes from. It is morally important. Our research shows it's a stupid decision because the greatest leverage you have over a country is in this phase of Canada status opening accession negotiations. That's all the research we've done on the Western Balkans and previous, you know, before in the Central Eastern Europe, because we have just have given this away. I understand why, right? But I'm saying, um, so it's going to take even longer because we're now opening. So the proof of the pudding will be the security guarantees for Ukraine. That is the Ukraine, I mean, accession to the EU. They know very well this is going to be 10, 15 years down the road, possibly. What they need, though, to end this war is a security guarantee. Now, who's going to give that security guarantee? Huh? That is going to be the big question. Then that asks, listen, how strong a European identity discourse do we actually have? It might be strong enough to deal with the costs of the refugees and the, even the energy crisis. Is it strong enough to ask Germans? Again, you know, I mean, we don't really have a fighting army, but we are moving a battalion out to Lithuania. <laughs> just let's just imagine for a moment we would move that battalion into Ukraine as a tripwire, right? Um, would the Germans be prepared to die for Ukraine? I doubt it, right? So that is, I think, you need a much stronger identity for these kind of decisions. So I just that was just a point I wanted to make. Okay, um, why haven't I uh, addressed the issue of Disintegration, regression, disintegration. I could say, well, um, you know, I mean, Brexit is Brexit a crisis? Was Brexit a crisis? Pfft, I don't think the UK leaving the EU put an, posed an essential threat to the EU. Why? In fact, some people would argue, on the contrary, finally we can move forward without compromising all the time with these Brits. Minor detail that they, they, they accounted for 26% of our budget, right? That is an issue. But is that an existential threat to the European Union? Hmm. I have my doubts. I think Schengen, Euro, COVID were of a different kind of crisis than Brexit, right? And that might also explain why the European Union has not disintegrated. It, of course, depends how you define disintegration. If a member state leaving is already Disintegration, yes, there was disintegration, but that's not how I define my dependent variable here in terms of crisis outcomes, right? The crisis outcomes in terms of upgrading of, the, of common interest, there has been remarkable upgrading of the common interest in Brexit negotiations. The Brits had hoped to split the member state governments and they miserably failed. Even my own country, Merkel, I fell off my chair. The first day she said, oh, we have to be pragmatic, we have to find bilateral deal. No, it took two days, and Merkel turned around and united we stood ever since, much to the chagrin and surprise of the British, right? And so I would say the Brit if, Bre if I had included Brexit, it would have been not a case of disintegration, but again, a case of upgrading of the common interest, right? Okay, I had one more point, and then I shut up. Hold on. Um, 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 yes, uh, the politicization issue. I fully agree. Uh, politicization, there is a link between politicization and identity discourse. That is, that is my whole point. Politicization becomes ever more likely, particularly if costs are involved. And, you, and, 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 and the, 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 the Putin's war against Ukraine does not only impose tremendous costs on Ukraine, it also creates costs for the Europeans, right? So there is potential for politicization. And again, the question is, why not? And the answer is that the identity discourse has sort of, Alberto Spraja once said, silence, domestic opposition, right? So it has, I just repeat the point I made before, it has sort of limited the, the possibilities of the AfD or other populist parties to mobilize right, to, uh, to use this instance, um, the cost of the energy crisis, the refugees and what have you, against, and that has then facilitated, has, has sort of enabled the governments, right, uh, it's a two-level game essentially, the governments um, uh, to agree. Now, um, Hungary, I mean, Orban was bought off. I mean, I don't believe for a second uh, that he really was convinced or brought, he was brought around, right, I mean, still, it doesn't work. I mean, and, and I want to come back and, and, and then and, and stop here, to back to the, to, to the current conflict in the Middle East. Why is it so difficult for the member state governments to agree? Is it because of the politicization of the issue? I'm not so sure, actually, right? Um, and so 
there was a point I wanted to make. Mm, I forgot it. Um, give me a second. The, 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 oh yeah, the last point is upgrading of the common interest does not necessarily mean it has to be all 27 member states. We have the possibility of PESCO, right? The structured, uh, what is it, uh, uh, Christian, help me. PESCO stands for? Enhanced cooperation. Enhanced cooperation. Eight member states can move ahead. So when it comes to security guarantees, for instance, not all the 27 member state governments and parliaments would have to agree. It could be France, Germany, Italy, those member states who have the capability to issue a credible, credible security uh, guarantee. Is it going to happen? I'm not so sure. But that comes back to the question how important institutions are. Now I have my point back. The idea by a lot of EU scholars that institutions foster the upgrading of the common interest, I think, is false. You need an upgrading of a common interest to get institutional reform. But institutions per se don't. Don't, 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 don't cause it. They might help, right? But the idea that only giving the EU more power in terms of competencies and, and qualified majority voting would give the EU more power and to make the EU more powerful, this equation just doesn't work. There is no empirical evidence whatsoever that centralization, pooling, and delegation makes the EU more effective. I want to see the evidence. Convince me. But you wouldn't believe how strong a belief this is among a lot of EU scholars. And this is why a lot of EU scholars really believe that the, wor the, 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 the world is coming to an end and the, the sky is falling down if we don't get a treaty reform. Ah, that is my point. Treaty reforms, institutional reform require treaty changes. And it's not going to happen, right? And the good thing is it doesn't need to be happen, not only it uh, doesn't it do a thing, it could be counterproductive because it will undermine the accession perspective of Ukraine. If the EU starts now negotiating on treaty changes, we're gonna spend the next 20 years, right? And so, and it will also fuel the populace. It will, it will, it, it, it will give them something to hammer against the EU. And we have upcoming elections next year, European Parliament elections, so Stop talking about treaty change. The EU has all the institutions and instruments. It is the upgrading of the common interest that needs to be there. And if it, that is lacking, you know, institutions don't do a thing. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for this uh, uh, superb uh, response to the, uh, to the discussions. Now is the time when uh, you can also ask uh, your questions and we have microphones, uh, a microphone here in the middle. So thank you very much. My name is Mara and I would have two questions. So first of all, I got the idea from your paper that at the end of the crisis, you have these results, this further integration or disintegration, but you have these results regarding integration. For example, the opening of Moldova accession uh, discussions. But what I would like to know is if you consider these results, actually the crisis are at the root of the results, or do the crisis only offer the so-called policy windows for, for starting for, or for obtaining those results? And the second question would be regarding to your last point. Um, you said that upgrading common interest shouldn't only be regarded in terms of all EU member states agreeing on the same thing. Because you can have these um, selective groups of member states who agree on certain issues. But I'm just curious, doesn't that create more, um, more division actually in the <coughs> EU at EU level? So these would be the two questions I have. Thank you. Yes, I suggest we take uh, another lot of questions just next to you, and yes, and, and then uh, maybe we can, you can answer, Tanya. Okay, uh, thank you so much. It was a super interesting discussion so far, and what I try is to understand a little bit more the point about politicization and depoliticization, because from the discussion so far, you could have the impression that 
politicization is deconstructive. Um, and my question is, isn't there also something in the European Union like constructive politicization? Because yeah, there is, for example, something like a European parliament, there are European elections. So in this framework, we also might want to have a politicization on these topics. Yeah. Now it's on, hello? Can you? Okay, now, okay, excellent. So let me start with the last question, um, which is an excellent point. And I agree, politicization, the normativity behind it is a negative one. And that has something to do with the normativity I mentioned at the end, that a lot of EU scholars believe more integration is better and politicization is a challenge to more integration, right? The permissive consensus has allowed, allowed member state governments to move forward for the longest time and that ended sort of with the Maastricht Treaty onwards and now there is this, as you said, right, this uh, dismissive, you know, the constraining, you know, what is the census or dismissive? Constraining the census. Exactly, so it's negative, clearly, because it prevents further integration. Now, first of all, you can say, as, as I would say, more integration is not necessarily always a good thing, right? Um, so, and secondly, as a Democrat, uh, from a normative point of view, I would totally agree with you. Politicization is actually a good thing. If, 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 the, if, if, if national sovereignty rights are increasingly transferred to the European level, behind the backs of the citizens, so to speak, right? That, from a demo democracy point of view, is not necessarily a good thing. So I think politicization as such is not the problem. The problem is, when you try to silence it or ignore it, which a lot of European elites tend to do, right, and then leave the scene to the, the right wing, the authoritarian, whatever you want to call them, populist, the Euroscepticisms, right? So politicization is one-sided. It is very often the Euroskeptics, the hardcore Euroskeptics, the nativist populists, arguing against, there is very little, it's an asymmetrical politicization in the sense that the, the defenders of the European integration project are not very active in engaging. And that is the kind of, what I would then call constructive politicization. If rather than trying to shirk the debates about the future of the European Union, right? Politicians would actually engage in a discourse and make a case for Europe, right? Then I think politicization can actually have a very positive effect. And this whole neo-functionalist idea, you know, integration by stealth, um, is based on, I mean, neo-functionalism, let's not forget, Ernie Haas was very aware of the losers of integration mobilizing, but it was always seen as a problem, right? I mean, these people, we have to somehow deal with them, that they have a legitimate cause. So, I mean, I would fully agree. I mean, I, as you know, my cluster of excellence is about contestations and contestations, liberal democracies need contestations for their legitimacy. And if they silence, if they repress contestations, that is a problem. So you're absolutely right. Now, to Mara, to your two excellent questions. Um, first, agreement is not the same as upgrading of the common interest. There are a lot of ways. You know, upgrading of the common interest means actually that you put your national interests um, sort of not behind. You don't ignore them, but you sort of, you take a step back and said, you know, I'm not insisting on getting my national interest through, you compromise, right? And that idea of compromising is something that goes a little bit against the idea of majority voting. I ha I'm deeply skeptical that majority voting will actually solve any of our problems we have in the European Union. Yes, we have member state governments that regularly veto, right? But simply overriding their veto doesn't do the trick, as we've seen in Schengen, right? Uh, with the qualified majority voting, the relocation, the mandatory relocation of, of refugees, it didn't work. Not a single member state, except of Malta, and I think one more, accepted the quota of refugees, not even Germany or Denmark or Sweden. And the countries that were outvoted didn't accept any. Now, and even if they had, do you really want to force refugees to live in a country where they are not welcome? 
So this idea that qualified majority voting is actually the way forward, I find A, there is no evidence that it works in terms of effectiveness, and again, it creates a backlash by the populists, right? So I'd rather have, and this is what upgrading of the common interest means, it is essentially you have a debate, politicization, and then at the end of that debate, you decide that doing it together is better than doing it alone, right? So, um, okay, then the, the last point, I'm not entirely sure whether I got it right, I mean, outcomes of crisis, um, and whether these, these outcomes are actually caused by the crisis or whether the, the crisis created more an opportunity, right? And now, um, you know, exception perspective for me is not an outcome of a crisis. It is an indication for an upgrading of the common interest. The member states, <laughs> governments, have not been able to agree for a very long time to give any new member, in any new country is a membership perspective, and even, even more, to move forward with the accession of countries like Northern Macedonia, um, who clearly have, which clearly have fulfilled the conditions to move forward, right? And the decision that, that they were able to do that with regard to Ukraine and Moldova will put a lot of pressure on them now with the Western Balkans. They cannot possibly open the accession negotiation with Ukraine without uh, moving forward with at least Northern Macedonia, um, Montenegro, Albania. And Albania, and even Bosnia and Herzegovina, right? And so that is, I think, um, that is what I mean by that. So it's an indication for upgrading of the common interest and not, not an outcome uh, of the crisis. Okay, I think I stop here. Thank you very much. We have a question here, just, uh, just here first. Thank you so much for a fascinating set of interventions from all participants and for your coming here today. My question was also thinking about what you first set out as the main goal, which is to explain not a single crisis, but variations in response and outcomes of crises. Um, and I was thinking that uh, given that these are sequential crises that we list, uh, given that the question is what brings about unity in one case and not in others, uh, particularly the Schengen case that we discussed right now, and I think the interpretation of Luxembourgish presidency of the Council of the EU is sort of bulldozing through this set of rules that are then not followed. And the point about majority doesn't really matter because if there's no political will in each country, then that is moot. I think that's a point that's made by Luca Medela, among others. I think it's really interesting to think of political learning in that sense. And could we argue that, apart from interdependence and identity, there's also a set of political learning involved in the response to crisis. And just as now, we're beginning to realize the limits of these theoretical approaches. Maybe policymakers themselves have realized it and have begun to approach things differently, following from Schengen, maybe even Brexit, and the realization that Britain doesn't need to be in the EU for us to be able to cooperate adequately with a government that is actually serious about it. Uh, and how could we extend this in terms of <coughs> political learning, this new approach, perhaps, to European integration, to the new crisis in the Middle East that you were discussing? Mm -hmm. Thank you. So just, yeah. Good evening. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Douglas Weber from INSEAD, where I'm an emeritus professor. Uh, we know each other quite well. Um, thank you, Tanya, for your uh, stimulating uh, presentation. I'd like to thank also the two discussants for their remarks. I have two very brief remarks to make. First, I'd like to lend my support to both discussants, Christian and uh, to Jan, concerning the role of military security and security threats as a very powerful force for forging a common European position on the Ukraine war. I think no one mentioned the uh, perhaps contentious concept and theory of realism uh, in their remarks, but uh, I don't think any realist theory had the slightest problem uh, trying to explain why the EU found a common position on the Ukraine war very quickly indeed. It's really all about a perceived, a powerful, common perceived threat uh, and I don't think when they sort of woke up on the morning of February the 22nd or 23rd last year, they said to themselves so much, oh gosh, uh, Putin's invaded Ukraine, he's uh, trapped on their rights of national self-determination, the human rights, he's going to destroy democracy in Ukraine and so, uh, uh, and so on. I think they said to themselves, shit, <laughs> uh, he's invaded Ukraine and we, may, we, we might be the next to, to, to be on li in line, particularly of course Lithuanians, Estonians, uh, Latvians uh, and the Poles. Huh? 
So I think really here you don't need to go far much, far past the quite conventional realist explanation to explain why the, why the Europeans rapidly found a common position on the issue. The second remark I'd like to make is it's not so surprising either in my view that uh, this crisis has not led to a, a closer European integration in, in the field of security because there's already the NATO there. Why would you exactly. want to reproduce something that already exists exactly. at a time when there's an acute military threat? Uh, you fall back on what you have. And of course, you mobilize the EU in conjunction with NATO and you organize the financial aid and all these kinds of things to take care of the refugees. But the military threat is something really for which NATO is made. And we have, of course, the United States involved. And as we well know, when it comes to military aid to Ukraine, uh, the United States support is way ahead of that of the Europeans. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let me also again start with the second um, military threats. Absolutely. I mean, how can one not appreciate their importance? Let's not forget European integration project did not start as an economic project, but as a security project. Hello? You know, I mean, you, this is the, all, all the beef we have with Andrew Moravchik, who starts this history of European integration in 1957 and conveniently forgets that we had first in 1951 with the European community of coal and steel. The whole purpose was to prevent Germany from rearming and running over Europe a third time, right? So I think it's very important to keep in mind that the European integration project was always at least as much political as it, it's become economic, right? But the difference I think now is that <coughs> it is security against Russia. I mean, you can argue about security against Germany, but Germany has been, unlike the plans for the Brussels Pact, for instance, right, has been part of the collective security system and not, there was not a security alliance built against Germany at the time. And now we are asked to, I mean, the idea is to build a security alliance against Russia, right? That is sort of, that would be the functional logic of integration. The question is, how does this gonna pan out given the fact that there is NATO, right? I mean, we have a security alliance that arguably was also, and most importantly put together, established as a security alliance against the Soviet Union. So why should we, as you said, I mean, it's a convenient excuse for countries like Germany. You know, we can still rely on NATO. However, that is my second point. The Europeans have offered membership to Ukraine and more than potentially Georgia to the European Union, not to NATO, right? Knowing very well that you I mean, we have now the discussions whether we should accept Ukraine into NATO, but I mean, that would immediately activate a security guarantee. Um, it brings me back to the point I made before. Are Europeans prepared to die for Ukraine? I'm not so sure about that. And so, but then there are the elections in the US. And you remember, Donald Trump already announced the first thing he will do if he gets reelected, he will leave NATO. And already the Republicans are no longer willing to provide military support to Ukraine, right? And it's only the young Tim Biden has drawn with regard to military aid for Israel that keeps the potential. So the Europeans will, at some, at some point, we might end up with the question, how much can we rely on NATO, right? And that might change the ball game. So we have to see what's gonna happen. So, and on, the, on, the, on your question about policy learning, very intriguing. One might hope that this is the case. And the one lesson I would hope policymakers would have learned is that more power for Europe doesn't equate more power of Europe. But I'm, a, and again, it's an empirical question, but if you look at, what is it called? The club for qualified majority voting? I mean, our chancellor, the only thing the only vision he has for Europe, if you can call it a vision, is qualified majority voting. That is the answer to all the questions he gets on Europe, right? And there are also other governments that make this point, and they are only then confronted by the by the populist governments, particularly in Central Eastern Europe. And that is something also comes back to identity. And I would be curious to hear what Jan you have to say about that. One of the lessons we learned, we as Europeans, as West Europeans from the Second World War and the Holocaust was that national sovereignty needs to be constrained, right? It's a problem. It's not part of the solution. 
integration is about constraining, taming, and eventually overcoming national sovereignty. That is a lesson that is not widely shared around the world. It's not even shared in Eastern Europe, all right? And I think that is something we need to keep in mind. And we need maybe to unlearn that lesson to some extent. It worked very well in Western Europe, but we hit our limits when it comes to some of the Eastern European countries. And again, there is a normative argument to be made. How much sovereignty can you actually transfer to a regional institution given the identity constructions you have for currency, probably less problematic when it comes to war and peace question. I'm not so sure. And there's as much power you can give to European Parliament. I don't think the European Parliament can, can generate enough legitimacy to take such decisions, right? But this is again, and not only a normative, also an empirical question. <coughs> and I would put a big question mark to what extent policy makers have learned anything other than that depoliticization is not so easy anymore, right? And um, there, even if you don't strive for treaty reforms, the, the secondary law changes that worked in the Euro crisis, let's not forget, we have a banking union without touching the treaties. Hello? This is huge. I mean, we've taken steps towards financial integration without any parliamentary legitimacy. I find that normatively problematic. Effectively, it's worked. So, I mean, and that, the question is, why does it work when it comes to currency issues, and why doesn't it work when it comes to common foreign security <coughs> issues? Thank Shall you. I jump in on Eastern Europe? Yeah, I mean, I think that's a very good point, right? We're, we're sitting a few kilometers from Versailles, where a certain German chancellor declared Germany a country, but in 1871, that's a long time ago. Yes. There are countries, I mean, number of countries in the European Union did not exist 35 years ago. They did not exist. They had never, or hardly existed, right, or for, for, for 20 years. So there is, there is a certain lag in terms of this development. And, and I, I suspect that these types of questions of identity require either a long time or a very brutal exogenous shock, as was the case yeah. for Germany yeah. and, and the countries around it, right? So in a way, we probably need that, but the cost of it is so high that we probably don't want it. Um, the second point that I want to make in this context is that, you know, again, it's not at the country level. There is a huge competition over this within every single European or East European country. Look at Poland, right? There was yeah. an election. The election turned out well. Could have been a little bit better, but it was close <laughs> enough, right? That's very normal. Uh, it was close <laughs> enough, but the point is this is contested. Not everyone there, right? Uh, it's a little bit more problematic in Hungary, but not everyone there believes in this conception of sovereignty and this conception yeah. of national identity. Thank you very much. We have uh, two questions, one here first on the right, and then one just behind, just next to you. Up, stop, yes, yeah, <laughs> and, and then three steps behind. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation and definitely good uh, paper. My name is uh, Olena. I'm here a visiting professor within Civica for Ukraine project. Uh, and I have two questions. Uh, first one uh, is, did you go early in uh, 90s when Ukraine, after the Soviet Union uh, breaking, was the uh, strongest country after US and Russia in terms of nuclear weapon? and it was a decision of Ukraine to give all this weapon uh, and the promise of other countries to uh, defend us. So also I am very grateful for all the support uh, from European countries. I also see it not only as a goodwill, but also as an um, answer to this promise that was made to Ukrainians to defend them if something happens. And another question, no offense, but um, I think that maybe calling it Ukrainian crisis and saying that uh, Ukrainians will uh, that Europeans will die for Ukrainians is one of the reasons why uh, pro-Russian forces are winning in some countries. And maybe we need to call it uh, Russian war against Ukraine and saying that Europeans may die because of Russians but not defending Ukrainians. Thank you. Just, behi just behind, there was a question just next to the... Okay, let's... Well, next, you'll be next. But let's first have you. 
All right, thank you. Um, Thank you very much for the presentation and for the discussion. I'm a professor, an assistant professor of European law here. Uh, my name is Rafael Xenidis. And I, have a, I wanted to come back on the point of identity um, and boundary making. And so specifically, you know, beyond the distinction between them and us, uh, and the question of whether the Ukrainians actually belong to the European Union or not, I was wondering whether there was also not a development that kind of went under the radar of institutionalization in the form of a change of European identity into a right to defend one's identity. And this has been enshrined in you know, um, decisions by the Court of Justice, if you look at uh, rule of law conditionality, for example. And so that might consolidate uh, later on into you know, changes that, that might take political form. But at the moment, I think the language of law is actually doing some of the job um, of institutionalization, I think. Uh, Tanya, do you want to respond yeah. to these two questions? That is, that is an excellent point. Um, I just want to make, the question is, what is this European identity based on, right? And the identity construction at the moment is about liberal values, right? And again, President Zelensky has been brilliant in framing the whole issue the war, you know, the fight, the defense of Ukraine against Russia, it's about defending European ACA liberal values. You could also argue that we have paid for that globally, because as a result of which, in the global south, a lot of countries say, well, if this is about, is this about defending European liberal values, then this is not our problem, right? It's your conflict. So why do you have expect us to join you in sanctioning Russia? You here with you. So that's my first point. My second point is so I mean, I think this is what this conflict is about in terms of values and principles is not liberal with a large capital M. It is about the fundamental principles of the international order of the Second World War, and that is territorial integrity and sovereign equality. And that is not particularly liberal, right? And if we had framed it that way, it would have been so much more difficult for countries like India, Brazil, <coughs> even China, right, <coughs> to, 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 to support Russia against the liberal West, right? So I'm saying, you know, that is my first point about the ambivalence of framing this maybe European identity um, about liberal values. Um, second point, we're not particularly good at defending or protecting our liberal values when it comes to countries like Hungary and Poland, which then reinforces this, this reproach of hypocrisy and double standards by the global south. So again, that, that fight. And the third point is, with all due respect to Ukraine, right? But if you look at the democratic, I mean, I, I, okay, let me start differently so that, 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 that I get it right. I think this, this war is not about Russia's national interest, it's about Putin's regime survival. And the threat to Putin's regime is a democratizing Ukraine. It's not about NATO expansion, it is that with NATO expansion and EU membership comes liberal democracy, peace, prosperity, with freedom, right? And Putin cannot provide any of these three things, right? So and that, to me, is what this <laughs> war is about. So, and the European Union, I think, has also decided to support Ukraine because it knows very well it will have to pay for the reconstruction of Ukraine eventually. So better use this and make sure that, and support Ukraine in its ambition to become a liberal democracy. But at the time, I mean, I'm a great fan of, of, of President Zelensky, but when he was came into office, you know, I mean, you can see what an accession perspective can do to a country in terms of the reforms he introduced. And, so um, don't get me wrong, but making this up only about <coughs> liberal values has some serious negative consequences we have to deal with. And my last point about this, I mean, the Budapest declaration. Now you ask, I would not hear, but if you ask my students, nobody has ever heard of that, right? And to my first point, second point, security guarantee. It's, it's great what we're doing for Ukraine. But a security guarantee, excuse me, implies to me, if it's credible, that we move our asses, excuse my French, to Ukraine and fight with Ukraine. And not, I mean, and think about the debates we had. Germany 
extend a credible security threat. The one the U.S. is providing for Israel at the moment, right? I mean, that is a credible security threat. Two aircraft, there's already, I mean, two aircraft carriers, actually it's a whole other lot that comes with them of firepower, they could level Iran into a parking lot. That is a credible security guarantee. No such thing that Europeans are currently prepared to provide for Ukraine. So, huh? Yeah, or well, able. Well, I mean, yes, Germany for sure not. But I'm saying, you know, <laughs> in that regard, even if people would remember the, the Budapest uh, um, memorandum, <coughs> I mean, security guarantee, think about, I mean, wasn't it Churchill who said once, I only believe in a security guarantee when actually a country is willing to put troops, boots on the ground, mm -hmm. right? That is the proof of proof. Mm -hmm. of France and Britain gave a security, no, Britain gave, gave a security guarantee to Poland. I had two questions. The first one for Professor uh, Brazil. So I agreed when, when you said that qualified majority voting doesn't necessarily work when you vote against the veto of certain member states because they won't implement it, the decisions that has been taken against their will. Uh, so I'm wondering what is the potential remedy for that? Like give opt-outs like we've done sometimes with, I know, some directives for Britain or try and force unanimous decisions or will that just not work? I'm wondering, this was my first question. And the second question was for Professor Ravni uh, because there's something that's been bothering me since the beginning of like the renewal of uh, the Ukrainian crisis. Um, as you know, I'm Hungarian and I do not understand why there is like a lack of fear from Russia in my country. As you've said, we weren't occupied by the Soviets during the Second World War, but we were afterwards that. and there was a pretty bloody revolution in 56, etc. and people are still alive that should remember that. I just, I don't understand why we support. <laughs> Thank you very much. Do we have one more question? Yes. Uh, thank <laughs> you. Uh, good night. And I go a little bit like in a different way here. Uh, I don't know if, if you can go in this direction, but we've been talking a lot about like the European Union in the center conflict, but you have brought like other blocks uh, and other organizations like participation of the United States uh, and the, the BRICS in the situation. And I would like to understand a little bit more about your instances on this because you've been saying a lot of like, it's more of a European matter, but it's been, has been like receiving interference from a lot of different countries. If you see like that BRICS really does support fully Russia, uh, if there is a lot of other countries that not necessarily participate in a certain <coughs> organization, but is supporting what you may believe is impacting in the European vision of an identity of it's not like the, the situation that they should be bringing themselves into or not. Mm -hmm. Tanya, you want to start, yeah? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, I mean, does this work? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for the question. I mean, uh, I would immediately answer, I don't understand it either, right? How is that possible? Um, but there is an answer to that question, and that answer is that threats are constructed. And there is a current government in Budapest that is not constructing this situation as a particular threat for very specific reasons, right? So you, you can just spin this, even though Hungary absolutely had a revolution that was put down in a very bloody fashion by Russian troops. It, it, it has a government that benefits in many ways and does not want to oppose Putin for a number of reasons, right? So, uh, and this government has control over the media on a level that is absolutely unprecedented in democratic Europe. So uh, I was recently in Budapest during student protests and my colleagues asked me to film with them these protests. And I said, why are we doing that? And he said, well, because none of this will be on the evening news, right? So uh, while Orban voted in favor of the sanctions in, in Brussels, he's put, he put up posters, which you have surely seen across Hungary about how Brussels is bombing, um, is, is making bombs that will be used uh, and framed the recent election as one where, you know, if the opposition wins, Hungary might have to go to war against Russia, right? So if you spin things this way, 
then suddenly the, the uh, actually thinking of the fact that you have been put down bloodily might w make you want to not go to war, right? So it's Interesting. it's the construction and the role of the government in it is is my take. But but you know y you you're from there, you probably have a sense of it too. Wow, that just reminds me of uh, there's a similar construction going on in Georgia, because I mean. It's a, it's a similar puzzle. Georgia and Hungary are two countries where there is a lot of public support for the EU, right? 85% of Georgians want Georgia to join in the, the EU. At the same time, the Georgian government does everything to destroy the accession perspective this country has for the very first time. They just ended the strategic partnership with China. Hello? Um, and you would expect, as Europeanization scholars, we would expect the yeah. public to turn to the streets and protest, as we've seen it in Slovakia, you know, um, during the Eastern enlargement process. Why is it not happening? So I've been to Georgia and asked them, and I said the answer is it's this, it's this framing that if we, if we get too close to the EU, if we have to choose, we actually will have to we will have to go to war with Russia, right? And um, this security, the Russian security threat, apparently is a really powerful um, explanation for why pro-EU publics still support, vote for Europhile governments, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah? Uh, something we don't, something probably we don't have to forget, and you 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 know that very well. Uh, uh, is that uh, domestic politics has not totally vanished, right? Uh, sure. And if you, if, you, if you take the, the case of Poland, it's, it's an interesting case, because when you see the rate of support to European Union, it's very high, but you can, you can vote for peace and, 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 and yeah. be very much in favor of European integration. Yeah. Why do you vote for peace? It's because peace is not bad for social, uh, exactly. uh, social policy, for instance. Exactly. You know? So this is something we, uh, we don't have to, to, yeah. to, to forget. Uh, not all the, the, yeah. the attitude and the, yeah. and, the, and the positions are defined regarding uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, European politics, right? And in Slovakia, it took quite a while. I mean, yeah. Mečiar was there for a yeah. good number of years, and it was not until 98. Why was it 98? M Milada Vakudova's great yes, book exactly, on this, right? Exactly. It, was, it was actually the EU that was able to galvanize the opposition that suddenly provided uh, a credible frame that was different, yeah. right? But it was the fact that there was something organized and even institutionally backed by the European Commission that provided another narrative saying this government is doing everything it can yes. to actually prevent you from getting in. Yes. That's not happening in Hungary. So there's the no politicization. That exactly brings yeah. us back to the point, right? I mean, um, and I think that what has changed also is the control of the media, as you said. I mean, 1998 was a very different, 1998 was a very different ball game than it is now. I mean, the control of the media, Orban and the, the, the Georgian dream government have is amazing, right? So there's a lot of manipulation possible. And I also would stress, people care about the EU, but they, they don't care so much that they wouldn't vote for a government. Exactly. So they vote for the government, not because it's anti-EU, but despite it is anti-EU, because the government provides other goodies. Exactly. And I think that is something for the comparativists to come to terms mm -hmm. that people are very concerned about social in and economic inequality. Exactly. But does it make them support left parties that promise redistribution to no, do something? No, they don't. All, all the far right parties are very in favor of, of welfare state. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, sort of yeah, yeah, but I mean, yeah. Orban, for instance, is also very neoliberal. I mean, they're not, I mean, the left party in Germany is essentially dead. You know, they just they just dissolve themselves as a group in the parliament because they split into two. In France, the left is a, an assemblage of whatever. You know, I mean, isn't that? I think that is exactly the same going on, right? I mean, people have certain attitudes, but there might be other things that are more important. What 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 are you saying about the Wagenknecht uh, phenomenon? Well, that is a very good question. I think. Wagenknecht has potential, but not because she she is left. She's promising welfare state policies because she's anti-migration. And there is some research that shows that if you try to endorse the 
the right wing populist discourse, people will vote for the original. Yeah. So eventually, she might actually help galvanize support for the AfD. We'll have to see. She's a very charismatic person. I mean, I think that is something to be taken into account. The AfD doesn't have these charismatic pe persons except for um, a few, but they are so out to lunch mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, they're Nazis. And I mean, for once, we see a certain emergence of anti-Semitism in Germany, but there is still a powerful political culture that constrains the possibilities for... Um, anyway, so I think that is the biggest threat of Sarah Wagenknecht is not the policy she's advocating, but her personality. She is like Trump. I mean, what has Trump done to the people he's claiming to give a voice to, right? But he has this, and Sarah Wagenknecht has something mm. similar. Okay. But, but some yes. would say that in Germany, when you build a party around the personality, you don't succeed, right? Well, um, <laughs> <laughs> depends on how you look at it. Well, yeah, I still don't understand why what people saw in Hitler, quite frankly. But I mean, no, 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 of course, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry, in, yes. in democratic Germany, of course. Not. Yes, and Angela Merkel was not a very charismatic person. <laughs> that is certainly true. So we'll have to see. There's one point about the, the global south. Um, I think it is a little bit more complex than, I mean, as much as I would like these countries to support, um, you know, or not support Russia, I understand why they feel compelled to do it. I mean, India... We're talking about dependencies, right, and decoupling. Sorry, Germany was so energy dependent on Russia. How can we blame India for being so militarily dependent on, on Russia, right? I mean, I think, again, there is a certain hypocrisy involved here, and I have no sympathies whatsoever for Orban. But I think the Orban case is slightly overdetermined um, because, I mean, Hungary is a landlocked country, right? So in terms of finding alternative, it's very heavily dependent on Russia, gas and oil, right? So, um, and if you are an authoritarian leader, the least you want is rising energy prices. So that is to give him some credit. And secondly, he's not a Democrat. I mean, of course he supports Putin, right? So I mean, I don't find it very puzzling why, 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 Or why Orban is sort of trying to you know, walk a fine line here <laughs> because he needs the subsidies from the EU, but at the same time, um, he doesn't want to let go um, of Russia. So and we could go through, right, Brazil and, and South Africa and, and China, and there is, of course, the post-colonial discourse, understandably, mm -hmm. you know? Particularly this hypocrisy argument is a serious one, and I think, and that is the point I wanted to make coming back to is our what is our identity about liberal values? Yes. If that is the case, Ukraine has to become a liberal democracy to join the European Union. Now, I was at the Foreign Office the other day, and there they say, well, there are all these geopolitical imperatives, so maybe, you know, we have to compromise on certain issues such as the rule of law. And I said, excuse me, what? You know, I mean, this will get us in trouble with, with Hungary and, well, Poland, maybe not, not, not anymore, but, you know, that, that, that undermines our credibility vis-a-vis -vis member states and also undermines our credibility vis-a-vis -vis the global south. I will say again, hello, people, right? Why is it okay for Ukraine, but not for okay for us? And, I, 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 you know, it takes a long time to comply with the Copenhagen criteria and be fully able to integrate into the single market. And the rule of law is sort of the fundamental principle for all of the above. So, I mean, compromising on the rule of law is certainly not a good idea, but my government tends to disagree. And op that comes back, opening accession negotiations now, I'm not so mm. sure whether this is such a brilliant idea. Although I recognize how much progress Ukraine has made, particularly with regard to the rule of law. So I really hope we can keep the momentum and uh, make sure. Hmm? Huh? Yes, in the context of it's, it's impressive, right? We, I think we, uh, I can see at least one more hand at the, at the back, yes. Thank you. Uh, thank you for, for your intervention and thank you, you for... Speak up a little bit? Yeah, yeah, of course. Thank you for your intervention and thank you for taking my, my question. Uh, it's a more theoretical one, I have to confess, uh, regarding your, your article. Uh, it was about that um, 
that equal sign uh, between institution and integration. Uh, we know that the integration theory of the European Union are really focused on institutions, but um, is, uh, is there some articles or some uh, contributions explicitly dealing with uh, that, um, that focus on institutions? Uh, or is, there, is that a feeling that we can conceive from all the theories gathering together? Or are there some articles dealing explicitly with that institutionalization focus? Thank you. Thank you. Do we have another question? No, so I get to ask my own. Hey, <laughs> I, I wanted to go back to um, um, to identity, and and we've managed to talk about identity a lot without ever talking about the symbolic. And I want to bring the symbolic back in, because that's exactly what it does. And uh, you know, it it articulates meanings and clearly very different meanings, but also emotions. Um, and um, I'm very interested in the, in the. Um, uh, the, the opposition you make or the ordering you make, um, the difference you make between order and border, because immediately as I was reading you, um, it um, made me think of Mary, Mary Douglas and her Greek group uh, approach to political culture, in which she has, in a sense, the order being the grid, what makes us together, what binds us together, what are the rules that we have ins inside the group, and then the border, which is what, how different are we from the others. So I, I think it's maybe that encourages me to go even further in thinking about how, you, uh, how you're taking identity and identity discourses here um, into, uh, into the direction of thinking about the symbolic. But going back to, um, uh, to the elephant in the room and the difficulties of, uh, of Europeans to, uh, to, f to find a, a way to, uh, to, to respond, um, to, to what would be uh, the, uh, um, the the type of uh, anchor the, of for identity that could be um, uh, used in the case of the Middle East? Now, uh, it's been very clear that in the case of Ut Ukraine, it was you know talking about uh, liberal <coughs> liberal values and uh, <coughs> and so on. So on the order side, uh, and with. Uh, with the Middle East, the, uh, the danger really is that the border dimension, which is really bread and butter for the, uh, uh, for the extreme rights of uh, various uh, kind, uh, um, re-emerges or can be, uh, can, can be led to dominate more the, uh, the public debate in European countries. Now, would you have any ideas about what kind of other dimension than uh, European values or liberal values the EU can use as a kind of symbolic anchor for its identity? Because I think that's really the, the I know, uh, maybe it's not an elephant in the room, but it's, um, some, it's a whale in the room. Thank you. Yes, these are, uh, I mean, it's really serious, serious questions, right? They, also troubling questions because, I mean, as a political science, we don't, we not only want to analyze and explain, we actually, to some, I became a political scientist because I wanted to make the world a better place. So, I mean, our, our theories also have to have some relevance here, right? And so let me start with the first point about the institutions. I mean, I don't want to be understood as saying that institutions don't matter, right? Clearly they do. Um, I think, and uh, they, they also do for European integration, <laughs> institutions, facilitate collective action, right? That is for sure. But the, I think it's, so, it's more what kind of institutions or can institutions do foster a particular type of collective action, right? Um, and the idea that supranational institutions are more effective, right? They, because, yeah, I mean, it's intuitive. We have transboundary problems and so we create institutions that foster the collective action at the supranational level to deal with these problems. Fully agree. Does that mean though that a computer in Malta based on a certain algorithm gets to decide how many refugees each member state has to accept? Question mark, right? So I think institutions as such are important. The question is, you know, um, it's more what kind of institutions can do what? That was, I think, my point. And 
I also think there is a tendency to see politics as a problem, right? That institutions somehow help us deal with rather than constitutive also for a polity to function. Institutions need politics for their legitimacy, right? You need contestations to internalize these norms and values. And as a liberal polity, you also need to facilitate these kind of contestations. Um, so institutions do matter. The question is what for exactly? Now, Florence, you, your questions are, are, are truly excellent. And I have two points to make. The issue with liberal values, right? I mean, the one thing about constructing European identity, which I thought was, was very progressive at the time, um, was it's a civic identity. It's not based on, on a shared history so much or a sh shared language or culture. It's shared values, right? So civic, like in the US or in France. France, the same, right? I mean, at least as I understood it. Now, if you make liberal values the basis, the, you, you run into two problems or two challenges. One is these are universal values, right? So universal claims. Um, so if you make liberal values the basis of a European identity, everybody is a European. So you cannot say the Turks are not European, the Moroccans are not European. As soon as they endorse liberal values, of course they're European, right? So that is the first point. You cannot really draw boundary borders on the basis of liberal values. You can only say there are those who have accepted the liberal values and those there are not. But as soon as, as they accept the liberal values, they become part of us. So that's the first challenge, which I think is actually a good thing, normatively speaking, but it is, it's a in very inclusive identity. It's actually global, right? The second point is some people argue, coming back to emotions, that with liberal values, you cannot mobilize the kind of affective attachment, right? Which I am not sure whether this is actually true. Look at Ukraine. I mean, I think, uh, you know, there are a lot of people who not only fight for the independence of Ukraine as a nation, but also for the independence of Ukraine as a democratic nation. So I do believe people are willing to die for democracy. But there is this argument in the literature that liberalism doesn't generate this kind of feeling, this kind of social glue you need to keep a society together. Again, to me, this would be a, a pickle question, but there is something to be said about that. Now, um, with the Middle East, it is, this is a really, really, really big challenge. But liberalism offers two angles to approach, to sort of for an identity discourse. The one, I mean, liberalism to me, as we define the liberal <laughs> script is, at the core is not only individual <coughs> self-determination, that is a very neoliberal reading of, 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 of liberalism, but there's also collective self-determination. Let's not forget there is sort of the sovereign equality of states, but also democracy is the expression of collective self-determination, right? So um, I do believe both collective self-determination and individual self-determination are at the core of the liberal script, as we call it. So now, what is at stake in the Middle East? It is the collective self-determination of two peoples, namely the Palestinians and the Israelis, and both have the right to exist, right? And um, so this is not about free Palestine to me. It is, oh, at least the framing is, is kind of tricky because then Hamas becomes a freedom, a, a fighter for the, a force for the, for the, for the collective self-determination of the Palestinians. And here you, th that, you can do that, but that comes with certain challenges, right? Because it violates the individual self-determination. Freedom fighters who do not accept the, the right to individual, so who violate fundamental individual rights and negate human dignity, I have a problem with, right? So I think the first step would be to disentangle the two. You, you recognize the collect, that's right to collective self-determination of both. That is non-negotiable, right? And then you also agree they're sort of fundamental individual rights that must not be violated by both sides. And then there, is the, then there is this tension in between. And then you have a political discourse about how you balance this tension. And there is 
clearly there is disagreement, but that is what politics is about. But then at least let's fight about these issues rather than question the right to exist for Israel or Palestine, right? Or rather fight over whether terrorists are actually freedom fighters or not. Let's focus on the issues that are really at heart of the problem. And here, liberal values can actually provide an identity discourse in which you can have this, these, these debates. That is, you know, I mean, that is all I can say at this point. Um, it's very abstract, but I think it would help if people were willing to, to you know, keep certain things separate. And, um, but it's difficult. On that happy Thank note. Thank you very much. <laughs> Do we have a last question? No? Oof. So, <laughs> it People, is... Can I just <coughs> say, Florence, this was great. Hmm. I mean, I had no idea how great this would be. I had a certain inclination. Uh, being at Sciences Po is always a pleasure, but this has been an extreme pleasure, not least to... I kind of write back to my colleagues that I had sort of, I don't know, at least 100, 120 students in the room, great colleagues, fantastic. Uh, fantastic discussions and uh, so thanks again Florence and the whole team for organizing this has been a true honor and pleasure thank, thank you, to you thank you thank you Thank you, Tanya, for your enthusiasm and your very nice words. Uh, I want to uh, thank you and to Fanny's for uh, coming to us and making us the suggestion. Uh, I want to thank uh, our discussants, of, of course, and uh, all the, the questions we had in the room. And again, on behalf of all of us, thank you very much. And we hope to see you again soon. <laughs>